Welcome back, everyone, to Kaiser Reich. I'm your host, Mr. Embracing Autarky as uh, the National Re uh, Revolutionary Government. Yeah, sort of, so kind of. But we got to talk about the formation of the League of Civil Rights. Like well, one thing, revolution has sparked discourse under freer China, but not always favorably. Many intellectuals have noticed a dissonance between Kuomintang promises and the party's state reality. Like flashes in a pan, most efforts to speak out have come to little except perhaps one. Initially proposed by left-leaning foreign journalists living in Shanghai, the China League of Civil Rights was formed in 1932 as a means of gathering liberal support for the Shanghai uprising. This new line of action including striking or creating a striking contrast between zealous oppression and Kuomintang liberation. Their manifesto included three tenets, to liberate political prisoners, to give legal assistance to political prisoners, and assist in the struggle for civil rights, including free organization, speech, press, and assembly. They sought the attention of both liberals internationally and from the Baiyang establishment, though were not successful at freeing any prisoners. Wang was unamused when Song Jingling, Kai Yuan Pai, and Yang Jingfo submitted a very public telegram last month on behalf of the League to the CEC. The letter demanded the end of arbitrary arrests and was signed by dozens of prominent figures in the party, academia, and the press. A peril abounds, and there is doubts on its longevity. Already, Song and Kai have been sternly warned for stepping outside the party orthodoxy, and anonymous death threats have come in, though their high rank protects them from any real harm. Others, however, not so much. Yang was gunned down in front of the Academia Seneca building yesterday afternoon, sending a chill through the League. Oh, wow. The League is also staggered due to infighting. New culture figures like Hu Xi and Liu Yutang have been reluctant to sign on unless the League commits to only using legal channels. <clears throat> uh, prior rivalries within the LCS has made the CSP hesitant to join the Royal Society in endorsing the League. Many of the original members have gone to the extremes, undermining Song and Kai's authority, ultimately. A rather elitist organization, it has also uh, struggled to gain much popular support. Special methods and infighting render the League impotent. I like radicalism. Song and Kai shape the League to, into a force of change. Oh no! Oh, as we're embracing Autarchy, but that's alright. Um, we're looking pretty decent overall. The Republic of China. I guess we're no longer the National Revolutionary Government. We are the Republic of China. Oh. Wait, who are you allied with? Anybody? Well, I believe you guys. Will horses be enough to take these guys out? It could be. Especially if we really focus the forces up here like this. Eh, you know what? Focus them down here, maybe. You could probably use an air base, too. We're trying to build a supply base up there as well, but still. We don't have very much, but we do have a little bit of cast. How strong are these guys? Two divisions. We do have artillery. A lot of artillery, actually. We still have militia as well, so that's not good. But that's not terrible. Uh, localized training centers. Oh, we need to increase integration and whatnot. Um, with this here, let's, let's go to Tibet. Let's be embrace Autaki. China for the Chinese. Um, what else we got here? So we got a lot of things we can do. Um, a lot of focuses that we still need to take and whatnot, but I'm sure we'll have a lot of things to do. Modern, oh, ooh. An array, which I've read before as well. One pull up, United Front and one pull up. If you want to do this again, please go ahead. But I think I want to do. Uh, let me grab this one Liberation of Chinese Women. Well, we still get the, all the economy stuff, so there's that. Pull up to National Spirits. Dare to Die Corps, War Sports, Artillery. We don't really have to have all these, actually, really. Encourage widespread radio use, that would make sense. 49 days, though, that's a long time. Hmm. Well, let's get, at least get the modern NRA. At least get that one. And they'll increase integration of Xinjiang. Also get Shangxi and we'll straight up annex them. Which would be nice. Yeah, fantastic. What is this? Modernize the Yellow River levees. The ancient Yellow River has brought life to the Han people for generations. The embankment project in the lower reaches of the Yellow River has been gradually formed as far back as the spring and autumn period. Since the Ming and Qing dynasties, the Yellow River has continuously been famed or tamed to avoid its potentially catastrophic flooding, but such levees and waterways are becoming more and more obsolete. The national government, therefore, will need to make efforts to modernize them to suit our 20th century needs. Oh, I get some free infrastructure. I like that a lot. But we're going to do this one first. Hey, we've got Shang-Chi. Look at that. Beautiful. Fall of Riga. Goodbye, Riga. Oh, uh, look at all these divisions we got now. Let time go on. Uh, let's see. Promoting the bicycle. The bicycle is a primitive and widespread method of transportation, one that the National Ministry of Transportation has been promoting. While the bicycle began to enter Chinese society by 1860, it did not win approval or nor did it become integrated into Chinese society. Due to the fact that the bicycle was primarily used by Westerners, it became seen as merely a tool and a curious handiwork of the foreign imperialists. Furthermore, the use of feet in the bicycle seems to deride. The Chinese notion of luxury travels made Chinese who were unfamiliar with the bicycle were accustomed to the rickshaw, as their feet would not be moved. Bicycles thus elicited a curious notion from the Chinese, who were inspired by the stamina of the cyclists as, wide, as the speed of which one could travel on a bike. 
The National Government seeks to expand transportation measures for those who are unable to afford an automobile. While luxury, initially a luxury item, those price of bicycles become so affordable that it's a vision for half of a million bicycles to be in circulation in China by 1949. A promising development. Cool. There you go. There you go. One, two, three. Here, come over here. You can make them all motorized, maybe, but that'd be kind of insane. Hey, better guns. Nice. We'll get that in just a second here. There you go. Happy June, everybody, once we do this. Sure. Happy June. Are you guys on the line? That's good. That's good. You can stop training, though. Doing the Reich's Pact. We've got the air base here. Got a little bit of gas. It's nice. I guess technically we will have to. Hmm. You know what? Instead of you just doing that, bring them all in. I could make them cavalry right now too. Why not? Could. Why not? Because I know supplies not gonna be very good. Now we have some subs we can work with. Ah, uh, so we need to get snorkels. Snorkels are pretty good right now. United Front of one polo. Despite the KMT's United Front policy during the League of Chinese Syndicalists, the part of Deng Guo. Uh, part of policy, in theory, had only allocated those Kuomintang membership to participate in the training laws of Wampoa. Nevertheless, in spirit of the Academy's first United Front policy, is those who are members of the Chinese Syndicalist Party allowed to enroll in Wampoa despite holding membership for both the CSP and the KMT. The Militian Militia International in China has nonetheless proposed that the KMT relax the strict policy in cultivating party members of Wampoa. They argue that the KMT is indeed to become the vanguard for free China, that it must be open to the idea of accepting other patriotic Chinese revolutionaries into the Academy's ranks. Um, <clears throat> Furthermore, they would like to be able to sponsor individuals from the LCS to participate in Wampoa under the proposed reform policy. While the, while the move has been met with warm reception by the Guo Moro, an LCS member of the KMT's political department, Along with more radical members of the LCS who do not have joint membership, but rather mostly loyal to the Chinese Syndicalist Party, their proposals have also been met with frustration, especially amongst more conservative members of the party. To them, the introduction of recruits from the non-KMT-aligned socialist leagues or unions will merely dilute the ideals of both the party and the army. As such a compromise has been proposed, to only allow a certain number of syndicalists from the CSP to partake in the new ranks, allow anyone from the National Revolution to join, allow only token CSP representatives, the ideas are awfully drastic. Built to create a force totally loyal to the KMT, Wampoa's graduates have fought courageously for the party, but sometimes the National Revolutionary Army can take a life of its own, demanding the revolution from with, even within the party. Hu uh, Zongnam is a veteran of some of the earliest KMT expeditions, but was deprived of his chance of glory in 1927. He nonetheless made up for lost time with the recent accomplishments in the battlefield. The successes are harder to dispute, but one question if these victories are truly to the benefit of the party. The Zion brutality of whose men had caused significant concern within the CEC, even as they have little choice but to allow him in public. A dauntless commander, but frightening sometimes. Oh, well, that's not good. In the meantime, so we could do all this stuff, but we don't have to do it, so I want to go do this one next. With the conclusion of the war resistance and the unification of Manchuria back into China, the KMT is finally able to proclaim itself as a true Republic of China. As the Republican dream is fully revived once more, the party plans to host its third, inter third national congress imminently, but fractures within the party may lead to drastic consequences for the Chinese nation. Nice. Declare permanent capitals next. Because we have all this stuff to do, too. Yong Ling Jia. Oh, great. Um... We do want, we need, so to complete this, we need more than 140, 196 factories, so. Railways, it's not bad, but still. Uh, we could probably this one next. Revitalize the Chongqing Electric Steel Mill. Established by the Republican warlord, uh, oh god, where'd it go? Oh god, there's so many here, it's not funny. Oh, both Cheng Gongbo and Sung Ziwen, both two giants of the National Reconstruction, share the belief that China's coastal industrial economy constitutes the foundations of the new republic. As such, specific, specially designated zones and coastal cities will help generate national capital under the watchful eyes of the state. Sure, why not? The Chongqing Electric Steel. Yeah, established by the Republican warlord Zhang Qiu uh, in 1919, the Chongqing Electric Steel Mill was initially designed to fulfill the desires of the warlord and his arms industry. So over time, however, uh, the factory came under the dominance of the various other warlords to plague Sichuan. With the national government seeking to restore order, the factories are now in the hands of the government. As such, the industries will be expanded and modernized by the government's efforts and hopes that the people can now and finally reap its benefits and not the warlords. We'll revitalize the Chongqing Electric Steel Mill next. But we still need to increase integration in Xinjiang and become a government of us, so. Landing craft is good. Chance is good. 
What do we got here? Patrol ship screen subs. Patrol efficiency. Sub detection. Sure. Two tank. How much do we get a day? Not even one. That's not very good. Still putting up this stuff over here, which is fine. Oh, there goes Haiti. Goodbye, Haiti. Hardly knew you. Alright, so can we go to war with these guys? Gong Jingjong. If possible. Can we do okay ish here? Sardinia's capitulated. It's fine. We started winning here. We're not we're attacking here yet, which is fine, whatever. Oh, stability. Oh, we didn't need stability, right? At war, negative fifty percent. Jesus Christ. Oh. Wait. Uh, did they one then? uh, sure, guys. Yeah. Piercing and heart attack. Soft attack. Yeah. Soft attack. I like soft attack. Oh. Oh yeah. They one. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. So we had to get that one done. So now we can do this one when we are at peace. Shouldn't be too long. So let's let's do a little bit of Chinese woman, just because I want more stability. It's not much, but it's something. Advanced computing machine is good. It's nineteen forty-two. Get some of this. It's good. 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 Basic sub snorkels. Can we get the next one? 200. Oh, that's not bad. 219 days. You know what? We're going to wait. We're going to get that the better snorkel. Italy's joined. It's fine. Oh, do we have to be peace for this one? Not fighting on the same side. Well, the war will be over soon. Or we just say. Where was it go? Revitalize it? Yeah, let's go ahead. Get an infrastructure. Another civvy. They've got quite a few divisions. That's all right. Oh, hello. Well, I mean, we're even stronger than we were last time, J Japan, so. I mean, you can try to come at us, but you're not going to enjoy yourself. I guarantee that. We don't have quite the Navy yet, but still. She could say? Nice. Loading harbors? Yeah, we can make some of those. Austria intervenes. Oh, I thought they already intervened. Oh, Russia's going to have a tough time then, probably. Nice job, guys. Keep it up. Good, good, good. And Tibet's gone. Tibet is rival Chinese land, as we all know. Now we're looking freaking amazing. You know what, since we're here, can we just find you two? Oh, we don't have fire, darn it. Bengal exists, huh? What a mistake. Got some material support. There you go here. You all go like here-ish. Oh, Qingdao got taken over by those guys, huh? You guys go ahead and train. Train. Um. Oh. Are we going to capture him or what? Oh, we did get him. Nice. Good job, guys. And we need some dockers recalling the Goo Brothers. The Goo Brothers uh, are the political family that came to Loyalists from Guizhou. The two younger brothers, Gu Zhengding and Gu Zhengang, studied abroad at the youth of the Sun Yat-sen University in Paris before joining the RCA in its exile phase. They came, became prominent organizers of then the Reorganized Commerce Association, um, <clears throat> often during the dirty rough of the Cheng Gong Bo, and in many ways rising stars to the radical faction. The older brother, born over a decade prior to Gu Zhengang, went down a different path. Gu Zhengang, oh, look at this guy, uh, entered the military school just about four years after the birth of his younger brother, studying in Japan and participating in the Xinhai Revolution. He fought in the Sun Yat-sen in the Constitutional Protection War and a leading member of the right-wing faction of the Kuomintang. He's become locally famous for organizing the Gendarmerie in Yunnan, while giving them the motto, Don't lie, don't cheat, keep your duty, and remember your duty. The conquest of Guizhou, the young Gus, has lobbied extensively for not only amnesty, but also an statement of their brother to command. Privately, they noted that the RCA is short on loyalist military personnel and having a Praetorian Guard of sorts, made up of Gu Zengluns, 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 fanatically courageous Gendarmerie might give them an edge in forestalling any coup. Naturally, of course, there are many who feel allowing not only a reactionary but a petty traitor into our ranks puts the entire revolution in jeopardy. The bonds of family cannot be erased. Ooh. Weekly stability and resistance record goes down. Loyal to the nation comes first. I like that guy. Fair to Tibet. Liberation of the Chinese woman. Here we go. Calling the Third Repatriated Congress. Responding to the excessive pressures, Wang Jingwei has announced on behalf of the Central Executive Committee plans for a special national congress to be held in Nanjing about three weeks from now. Formerly known as the Third Repatriated National Congress of the KMT, despite its name, it is expected that members of the League of Chinese Syndicalists and other Latin Republicans will attend. An itinerary has already been participated or prepared with a list of topics to be discussed, though the elephant in the room is the fate of Wang Jingwei himself. 
longtime party chairman and president of the Republic has cast a controversial shadow, despite his efforts to portray himself as a compromising figure. Many see him as a dictator in the making, increasingly untethered from the collective leadership of the CEC. His list of enemies has grown, and he and his allies have worked to consolidate power. Chief among these enemies, or enemies is the Provisional Action Committee, an intra-party faction led by Song Jingling. She has worked to assemble Wang's rivals into a workable coalition. While much of the military is known to prefer to see Wang gone, as Fiora is willing to endorse an outright coup. Uh, instead of it appears both factions are entering the Third Congress, with their knives sharpened. Only a select few know the full extent of either side's plan, but it's certain they will seek to assert dominance in the proceedings. The Third Congress will be the largest party Congress yet, with over a thousand representatives hastily drawn from every province and county, yet it still seems like the fate of millions will be decided by so few. Destiny beckons. So at least we get that done. We get more stability, get more war, uh, political power, war penalty stability modifier, you may wish to slow down your game speed. After a successful campaign in the Tibetan Plateau, we now have ta uh, task to establish a local administrative authority in order to restore peace. However, there are several options for choice. Just straight up annex them, I don't even care. Yeah, integration, civilian oversight, time we can integrate them. Alright, we slowed the game down. Now what? Defensive. Uh, let's keep going down our land auction first. Anything here we really care about? Ooh, it's Urban and Soul Specials. That's nice. Uh, occupation of Hong Kao. Uh, the torch is showing bright as a procession march just after dusk. In the town of Hong Kao, one of the three that make up Wuhan set the German concession established in 1895 in exchange for German support against Japan. The inland concession in China as a remnant of the terrible international mandate system that has plagued China in a constant reminder of the century of humiliation. Facing the advance of the Kuomintang, most foreigners fled, leaving the concessions effectively abandoned. Yet, due to the fears of international condemnation, the cities were untouched during the Second Northern Expedition, the Nationalist government decided to respect their sovereignty for the time being electing to wait for a better time for negotiations. <clears throat> for many soldiers and soldiers, however, even this was too much. With the Japanese driven out of China in a deadly war, the nation was seen as upswing in nationalism. Tapping into this energy is the China Revival Society, an ultra-nationalistic band of authors who have denounced the concession of Hong Kao as a void in the context of the Kuomintang's anti-imperialist policies. Spurred on by He Gong's Hun. A large detachment of CRS officers marched into the concession areas in the city, targeting the German concession in particular as revenge for the rule in the first northern expedition. Initially a disciplined formation, they were soon joined by the mobs of the locals, who proceeded to break windows and burn down foreign buildings in Araya. But perhaps even more startling to the press was the image of European flags being torn down and burned, replaced by the white sun, blue sky, and holy red earth, along their awaited a revenge. Nice, we need way more aluminum. How do we get more aluminum? Where do we get aluminum from? Looks like we have to import it from the Russian state. For now, that's fine. I do want to get support equipment and some planes. Avenging the humiliations. After the aftermath of the Hong Kong riots reverberated across China as heated discussions about the implications fill the air. Many are horrified by the mob violence, while plenty of other groups are jealous of the attention the CRS received, believing them to be undertaking or taking undue credit for the entire party's anti-imperial efforts. Whatever the case, Wang has remained strategically silent as the country braces for more imitators. Over the last few days, China has fallen into another wave of instability as riots have broken out throughout the major Chinese cities, especially near the ports. Disturbing reports of anti-concession violence have filled the airways and overwhelmed the police, worsened by the widespread participation of security forces. Even areas outside of the KMT control are expected to see instability. As the mob violence spreads, they have begun to break down across factional lines. Socialist mobs have extended the campaign against capitalist oppressors, terrorizing bourgeois neighborhoods and commercial districts. National groups have cast even our MMIC advisors as foreign imperialists, taking a strident anti-European and anti-foreign tone, many particularly the CRS accuse these LCS of being puppets of foreign control. With the situation spiraling out of control, the military has finally been deployed to restore order. With curfews declared and more discipline units sent in, the chaos has been brought to a close, but not before an MMIC officer was found dead. A movement is being torn apart. Oh, we're hurting ourselves with encourage a feminist struggle, but whatever. Maybe I should have taken that, but the situation in Tibet. The conquest of Lhasa by the National Revolutionary Army has placed the world's largest and most elevated plateau under the control of the Republic of China, though already trouble abounds in the new Tibetan administration. Having enjoyed de facto independence from China for decades now and having fought multiple wars to maintain it, many Tibetans are suspicious of the ambitions of the Chinese nationalists. With the Mongolian Tibetan Affairs Commission having been largely unsuccessful in creating a large cadre of Kuomintang members of ethnic Tibetan heritage, the party under the Allied Tibetan Improvement Party, formed in India, was some help by exiled Kuomintang officers. The pro Chinese Ninth Panchen Lama, born Dugdem Chokhe Ninya, has been installed as chairman, though with plenty of Chinese advisors looking over his shoulder. This has attracted complaints whether the bureaucrats in Kuomintang have been deployed, though, have proven actively detrimental to creating a lasting harmonious rule in the highlands. Many sides have the chairman, reporting directly back to Nanjing for orders. Tibetan Improvement Party leaders such as uh, Pan De Tsang, Rabga, and Jundun Chopail have pleaded Wang Jingwei in the Central Executive Committee for a Freer Hand, arguing that the TIP have long been loyal supporters of Dr. Sun's Three Principles and Modernization. Whether or not that is true is debatable, however, in their efforts to overthrow reactionary rule, it seems they have allowed democratic groups of various stripes under the promise of elections. This group's demand provisional, provisional elections 
during tutelage, adding to the instability gripping the region. In the wake of the growing power vacuum, more and more decisions have fallen upon General Huang Musang, the general advisor of Tibet, sent west by Kuomintang many years ago as a provisional head of the Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission. He has advised the creation of the Tibet Improvement Militia and has been given control of the NRA forces in that region in the climax of his decades of service. And then we'll talk about the fallout of the Nanjing incident. Trust their experts to implement tutelage. Give the TIP the needed uh, autonomy for legitimacy. Allow for some of the promised local elections. The military government maintains a steady hand. Yes, he does. In the aftermath of several days of rioting, there have been numerous casualties, but none as damaging as an advisor of the military mi Mission Militaire Internationale in China. Even though most of the MMIC officers escaped unharmed, the headquarters was raided and ransacked during the unrest, uh, apparently abandoned by Chinese security forces at the height of the violence. Three were wounded in the evacuation, but one was killed. The untimely fallen was uh, Jean Fontenoy, head of the training department, a decorated officer during the Great War and French Revolution. He was sent to China as part of the original mission, a writer, playboy, and opium addict. He was said he was considered at one point the, for the head of the mission, but was passed over due to his growing addiction and sympathies for the Surrealian movement. This attribute and his hands-on approach seems to have won over some members of the CRS, who came to pay their last respects before his body set home. André Malro, head of the nation, or mission, is outraged at the death of his former rivals, lashed out against what he believes to be a deliberate attempt against the lives of his men. In an angry meeting with the Central Executive Committee, he has accused what he describes as India clique of rightist officers of leading a conspiracy against the movement, hoping to hijack the revolution on the cusp of the revolutionary victory. He has pointed his finger at General Zheng Fakui and Zhu Yi, Zhu Yi, leaders of the old Chinese advisory group to Calcutta, as a center of the nefarious cabal. He has gone so far as to claim that his eyewitness is willing to testify to the two personally leading the mob. Reconstruction faction of line of CEC members, including Sung Fo, have immediately rose to Zheng's defense, angrily condemning what they claim are unsubstantiated rumor mongering. But it's clear that the liberal faction of the party is under pressure, and it's likely many PAC affiliated officers will go down with them. As Malro is escorted from the meeting, the CEC has broken out into a heated discussion. Now, wait just a second. October instructions. Well, as if things cannot get much worse, a series of documents now dubbed the October Instructions have made the front page news in major cities. The leakers who have chosen to remain anonymous claim they were taken from leading MMIC advisor M. N. Roy's office, and them include a series of telegrams apparently from Paris which contain a series of demands to be delivered to Wang Jingwei, an, an appropriate opportunity, ostensibly to help them consolidate power and maintain the international support. 1. The all China Federation of Labor, affiliated with the CSP, uh, is to be legalized and all Chinese unions placed under it. 2. An influx of syndicalists must be recruited into the army and syndicalists align officers promoted. Officers to old guard must be retired forcibly if needed. 3. Likewise, the party must be cleansed of those old mindsets replaced with younger socialists trained abroad. 4. Revolutionary military courts must be established to punish reactionaries. The original leak has been tracked down in newspapers connected with the CRS, particularly Qian Tu. Uh, but it's quickly been picked up by the PAC and RF affiliated papers. While they distributed within just a day or so, the contents effectively imply the MMIC hopes to sponsor a CSP coup d'etat. The time is incredibly suspicious, and the contents have denounced, been denounced by his forgery by Roy. Roy notes that he has been with the revolution since the beginning, and there's close ties with both factions of the party, but with the MMIC on the defensive, Li Zhishen has taken advantage of the moment to break his silence since the Nanjing incident. In a thundering speech, he has demanded the international military mission properly expelled, claiming that they wish to take advantage of the comrades' death and issue a power grab. He spirits a long list of officers who have threatened to resign in protest if the prejudiced investigation into the alleged India clique proceeds, with his name at the top of the list. Conversely, however, if the MMIC is expelled, as expected, the many thousands of officers that they had trained with will resign in solidarity. Expel them. Dismiss the India clique. Hmm. Well, we like the radicalism, so. Fortunately, we lost many good men. But Long Yun is here, so. Welcome, Long Yun. Welcome to the party. That sucks. Chen Gang, here. Unit promotion. <laughs> and then, who else do we have here? Left KMT officer, I like that. I like that a lot, actually. Hu Huang Yi Chang. I don't know I'm saying these names wrong, but whatever. It is what it is. Here's Matic, you know. There goes our command power. Also, we sent some volunteer divisions to the Prince of Federation because I'd rather have a Prince of Federated uh, led India than a Dominion because these guys are in the Entente. I don't want the Entente here. The Entente are a bunch of bourgeois capitalists, and we don't like those people for now. And probably ever. Uh, let's get a better RD eventually. So I'm thinking helping these guys would be better. Take out this group here, maybe, if possible. So that's why I sent volunteers down there. Now, do we have more planes yet? No, we don't. Darn it. Let's get that snorkel. It'll be done in like five months. Oh, this is a 105-day focus. I didn't realize that. Oh, my gosh. Well, Wang's opening speech. The Third International Congress of the Chinese Kuomintang's official been convened in the grand capital city of Nanjing, heralding the start of a new age for the Republic of China. At long last, the Great War resistance against the Chinese imperialists. 
or not the Chinese Imperials, Japanese Imperials, has been concluded and the region of Manchuria restored promptly to the Chinese nation. Chairman Wang Jingwei once more looked to the stand under grandiose portrait of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and the flags of the party draped along its sides. Uh, what was different, however, was a newly commissioned portrait of the chairman that was placed strategically to the right of the eternal premier, uh, a move that was marked with looks of scorn and anger by the members of the PAC. Wang began a speech by thanking the party for following true to the principles of Dr. Sun. And the martyrs who had sacrificed their lives during the war of resistance, while well, the revolution's phase of military rule is hereby concluded with the NRA's recent victory over the Japanese, uh, <clears throat> the revolution's party must continue as Wang warned of reactionaries within the ranks of the party who threatened to destabilize it. Nonetheless, the party's reshuffle is about to happen with the election of a new central executive committee, and the chairman anticipated it to happen. While he has been long remained apolitical from the quarrels of the RC and the PAC, he concluded that in his opening remarks that he believed a new reorganization of the parties needed to emulate the same changes to the party in 1924. It announced the conservatives within the India clique and the reconstruction of his faction as the degenerate forces stifling the spirit of the reorganization. The spirit has won the Second Northern Expedition. Um, Wang concluded his remarks with a firm acknowledgement that while the United Front policy with the Chinese syndicalists was not an aspect of the first reorganization, it was a grave mistake if the denunciation of the policy should be led to a rejection of the spirit of reorganization. While scores of cheers rang out from the delegates, the RCA, RCA and members of the CSP only polite applause was heard from the PAC section of the Congress, while members of the World Society and Reconstruction Faction stayed silent. An auspicious, inauspicious start. As the nation unites, party divides. All governing coalitions come, will come to an end. Nice. We need way more support equipment too, don't we? A league divided. Also, Gary Horses, you're now doing this job. We're going to start replacing you with... Armored cars. For years, the League of Chinese Syndicalists... <clears throat> It's adapted to the French political methodology of the syndicalist compromise with its fit multiple factions and unions coalescing under a shared alliance of the proletarian struggle. Cooperating with the Chinese Kuomintang in strikes such as the Hong Kong Canton strikes in 1925 as well as the Shanghai uprising in 1932, the policy of the Chinese socialists outside the KMT has long been one of convenience, especially due to the instructions of Paris and London. With well, the Kuomintang's victory in the Second Sino-Japanese War and the Second Northern Expedition, uh, the League has grown noticeably in terms of influence and now finds itself being courted by the Provisional Action Committee and the Reorganized Comrades Association and the struggle for dominance of the party. Among the factions of the LCS, the Radical and Young Guard faction of the Chinese, the uh, <coughs> Cynical Spire has grown in much strength over the years, with his members Qin Bangzhang, Hu Biubai, and Chen Xiaoyu controlling much of the CS LCS's functions and directives. The new school of Cynical Thought is undoubtedly empathetic to the beliefs of the RCA radicals, Faced with Chairman Wang's renewed call for reorganization, they rallied to the defense of the revolution. We stand against the reaction of subversion. subversion. The RCA will be strengthened proportionate to the cynical's popularity. Alright. There you go. You need commander here too, don't you? This guy seems pretty good to attack. Chen Jitang? You're gonna be aggressive as well once we get there. Jingjing delegates align with the opposition. The Third Congress has attracted delegates from near and far. Uh, all with their own agendas, but as they approached Nanjing, all of them pressed down <coughs> by the suffocating air of the division between the party's factions. Agents of uh, the chairman uh, and his opposition played a tug of war for support, relying on all sorts of unscrupulous tactics to win. One of the most valuable prizes has been the Xinjiang delegation, one of the more autonomous regional governments in the Republic. They have a degree of freedom that, from party patronage that make them a viable wildcard party in trees. It seems they have been drawn to the opposition, finding common ground for at least one of the dissimilar factions united in their abhorrence for Wang Jingwei. How long the opposition will hold the delegation's fancy remains to be seen, especially without a cohesive plan for the future, but for now they have won a viable addition to the coalition. Lines are being drawn, the liberals push on. The Reconstruction Faction has managed to survive across the collapse of the First Northern Expedition, the exile period, and the revival of the KMT fortunes, and yet there was some doubt how long they would last before fading to oblivion, abandoned by an increasingly socialist party. The Third Congress, many believe would be their last hurrah before they were sidelined, at best perhaps San Fo, and a few other high-level members would be able to scrounge up a favorable sin cure. If that was the case, however, they did not show up today. The Reconstruction Faction and the unofficial caucus meetings have acted as lively as ever, freshly energized by the fact that civilian rule is right around the corner. In their minds, the end of the war means the end of military dominance and priorities, giving the military, primarily civilian-based RF a leg up over both the PAC and RCA. Sun Fo sought to reinvent himself, and his clique as through and thorough liberals, proponents of constitutionalism, anti-corruption, and the immediate and a tutelage. Casting himself as a democratic hero, he has denounced that one-party statesman incompatible with his father's ideals, and with the final unification of China, he claims it is time for change. His writings make it clear to his audience, target audience, the thousands of moderate Republican intelligence who have long been treated as window dressing by successive governments. With the Congress in full swing, Sun has been sure to be photographed and interviewed just about at every opportunity, sincerely, some would say deludedly, believing himself to be Wang's leading opposition force, or figure. He has been openly calling for the chairman of the dictator to the press, challenging him to commit an immediate free and fair election nationwide if he doesn't. And not exceptionally charismatic, Sun nonetheless is a household name, and handshake by handshake, he's shaping up to be a threat in defense of constitutionalism. Sounds like we gotta get rid of a guy, huh?
Hey, Nestor, show it up. And you're getting attacked too. Where are your peers? The Long Shadow. Outside the convention halls, the fixers and schemers operate. These lobbyists were hoped to be by some combined to corrupt bourgeois democracies into a general buying establishment, but are unfortunately alive and well in nationalist China. Wielding carefully placed gifts, promises of job prospects, and a wide array of threats they may or may not be able to back up, they have engaged in negotiations with the wives, uncles, and friends of the delegates. But these are perhaps the least of the built budding Chinese democracy's worries. Operating in even more underhanded methods are the scurrying agents of the Lao Ban, who cast a long shadow over the convention. Politicians boast about the plots and plans, but few can match the sheer ruthlessness and violence of Chinese spy masters who battle in the dark on behalf of their factions. <clears throat> There are multiple reports of delegates who decided to resign their seat in advance of the convention for health reasons and numerous cases of sudden shifts and allegiances. Oh, wow. Tragically, however, there is little time or energy to investigate this epidemic of poor health, with all factions focusing the energy of the conference at hand. In an interesting development, observers have noted that this conference is the first appearance of what seems to be a CRS aligned caucus, led by former student, radical, and army officer Liu Butang. They are joined by other minor party celebrity Chiang Ching Kuo, the first born son of Chiang Kai shek. This group is believed to be the source of multiple solid rumors going around the Congress about Wang, accusing him of tales of betrayal, corruption, even murder, notably the late headmaster. You think this is bad, this buffoonery? They've done worse. <clears throat> wow, we lose a crop ton of stability. Proportion to the revolutionary radicalism. Popularity derived from revolutionary radicalism will be distributed between the China Revival Society and the China Syndicalist Party. Who needed stability? Or political power, apparently, too. Yeah, who needs that, right? The impeachment vote. At long last, enough was enough. Since before the opening of the Third Congress, the Provisional Action Committee has gone to work to ensure that the Chinese democracy does not doubt the dictatorial desires of Wang, PAC and the WM ARCA members have th secretly threatened bribing Kozhou members of the Congress to vote in favor of the PAC's attempt to upstage Wang. They have reached out to members of the League of Chinese Syndicalists, the Reconstruction Faction, even some RCA moderates, scrounging a revolt again in favor. With an unprecedented volume of votes from the members of the Congress, high-ranking members of the PAC such as Deng Yanda and Zhang Bujian have presented to the Central Co Advisory Committee of the Central Committee uh, and demand in the case of Wang Jingwei's failure to carry out the duties as acting chairman. Um, with the four elders of the KMT making up all but one of the Central Supervisory, Supervisory Committee members, impeachment was inevitable. However, a conviction requires a vote by the entire Congress, and that remains up in the air. Without it, impeachment by the Su Supervisory Committee holds little weight. Well, the charge is delivered. Song Jingling herself has gone up out of her seat to announce Wang in her name of her husband. While Wang may surely have been a comrade of Dr. Sun's, Song declared that Wang must resign him at once in order to end the phase of tutelage. The Congress lies stunned in silence as Wang Jingwei stands up to defend himself. The dies gas. The convention waits with bated breath. And what happens next? Is anyone's guess? Chaos on the convention floor. Oh, God. Wang stepped forward towards the uh, podium, undeterred by the jeers and curses of those around him. Braving a fusillade of slander and accusations of tyranny, began a speech, hoping to reassert control over the situation. Many of his owls were shouting back, hoping to drown out the hecklers. Wang was an experienced politician, but even this was too much, particularly a repeated charge by the crowd that had orchestrated the assassination of various political opponents to the rise to the top. His speech, elegant in mind, initially delivered with the practice eloquence, soon turned into an unhinged rant, dooming the convention. He rebuked his opponents, screaming of the presence of counter revolutionary traitors in the midst. Well, one by one, members of the Congress are called by a uh, vote, by roll call vote. By, ju by just four votes, Wang escaped impeachment as chairman by the party, though the PAC has made it clear they intend to press their case in the central or control of Juan to remove him as president. Ultimately, such constitutional niceties drew far less attention than when the ensuing vote by the next party chairman devolved into a fistfight by delegates as the election became contested by Wang Jingwei, Song Jingling, and the last minute candidate, Sun Fo. <clears throat> Wasting little time, Wang decided as incumbent. Uh, chairman of the party to suspend elections and quash the proceedings, arguing that the violence made an, a fair vote untenable. He announced a preliminary cabinet with Chen Gongbo as vice chairman of the CEC and Sun Fo as premier of the executive Wang. Feeling betrayed by the Reconstruction faction who appeared to have lost faith in the opposition alliance, Song Jingling and her allies have walked out of the Congress rather than confirm such an undemocratic measure. Fearing they would be arrested to ensure a quorum, a favorable vote for Wang, they have fled the capital. Can this get any worse? Yeah, who do you, you need political power at all, right? Advisor cannot be dismissed. The Fujian government. In the latest development of the intra party factions, a rival government has been established in the south. Led by Song Jingling, the Provisional Action Committee of the Kuomintang, they have declared uh, Wang's rule illegitimate and contrary to the principles set forth by Sun Yat sen Various dissidents have gathered there as a work to reform their own central committee rival to Nanjing. Most troubling, as a defection of War Minister Li Jishen to the fu cause fueling for the fuels by the military betrayal. It's clear that by this point um, that there will be no return to the status quo on either side, as any tension in tolerating another ineffectual power sharing agreement. The Kuomintang stands divided, and garrisons around the country are weighing their options to figure out which side to uh, back, back in Nanjing. The Reconstruction faction drawn a, a driven hard bargain in exchange. 
uh, for the support. They've secured it as collateral, Sun Fo as Premier, which you believe will give them control over the executive one. The press for further reforms in the legislature could reconstruction in constitutional matters. The incumbent President Wang, uh, Jing Wei, could hardly focus on the petty politicking, however. Um, the experience of the Third Congress has shaken the man, laying bears sharing of popularity. Against the advice of Chen Gongbo, he's determined to personally go south to Fujian as a sign of goodwill, claiming he has the negotiating experience of broken a truce before that situation grows out of control. Others, however, suspect his true intentions are to shore up his support in the southern coastal cities like Guangzhou, Hangzhou, and GMM. They accuse him of reaching out to the RCN radical CSP militias to reinforce his power base in preparation for self coup. Whatever the case, the four armored cars of the presidential motorcade left Nanjing this morning, heading southwards. Safe travels, President Wang. Oh crud. We promoted so many guys and now they all left. Gearing up for another civil war, huh? Remember, only China can kill China. And China's really good at the cycle of death. Oh! Well then, Wang Jingwei never made it to Fujian. Instead, his motorcade was found on a winding Zhejiang, uh, Zhejiang road about four kilometers from the nearest town. The corpse of guards uh, and attendants littering his path. The president and his wife were slumped over in the car, and their arrogant head of security, Li Shichun, also among the slain. Wang is the latest casualty in China's cycle of death, the perpetrator and victim of the nation's bloodletting. The Kuomintang may have brought order in the unification, but they have not brought peace. No one quite knows who ordered the ambush. The specific path was supposed to be kept secret, and despite promises of safety for a parlay. Wang will brought along heavily armed security at this point. No one cares. The forces in Mingan continue to gather in strength, pulling in defecting army units and sympathetic governors. Ding Yandao has been appointing, appointing command of the rebel ground forces, has marched northward to the bulk of his army to Nanchang, seizing the Jiangxi provincial capital. In Nanjing, the central government could hardly contain the mayhem breaking out among the lower ranks. Chen Gongbo, as vice chairman of the party, has moved to assume the duties of chairman of the Kuomintang and president of the Republic. Some Po has contested his bid, arguing that as premier of the executive Wan, he would be a constitutional successor. Annoyed, Chen then agreed to pull it up for a vote. To a surprise, the vote was deadlocked. The Reconstruction faction should have been outnumbered, but nonetheless marched in lockstep. The Residence faction, now decapitated with Chen Buchun's death and in total disarray, refused to commit to Chen's leadership. And so they decided to back Chu Minyi. Plenty of RC moderates will also reeling from the news of Wang's death and has expressed concern that Chen is too radical to diffuse tensions in the party. Nanjing has been also been paralyzed, a complete disaster. Holy crap. This is not good. How are we supposed to get this thing done? Maybe we should have waited to do all this stuff. Yeah, well, I think. We're supposed to have 17 more factories. I can't get 17 more factories. God dang it, why'd you get captured? Chen Gongbo overplays his hand. The nightmare just keeps refusing to cease. Every time Chen Gongbo seems to be making progress with Chu Minyi and Zheng Zongming, something comes up and they pull back. Meanwhile, Sun Fo has been making gains among the RCA moderates while dangling the possibility of a peace commission. All the while, the army of Deng Yangda has continued to slowly make gains, rendering the discussions moot. Without Wang Jingwei, its coalition of supporters has fallen apart and Cheng has released, has reached its wit's end trying to make peace back out altogether. So he tried a different trap. In the dead of night, Chen has reached out to leading military officers such as Zheng Zizhong and Zhu Enlai, hoping to use the military to force things back on track. Besides Zhu's so-called political department clique, Chen has also tapped into the ranks of the MMIC trained syndicalist officers such as Zhao Jinguang. Combined, he believes that this young guard will be sufficient to turn the tide. Moreover, he has made contact with increasingly resentful urban trade unionists, both RCA affiliated as well as those aligned with Chen Xiaoyu and the radicals of the CSP. If push comes to shove, mass strikes will sweep him into power. Unfortunately for him, he was outplayed. His messages has long been monitored by agents of the Dai Chong Feng and his scheme was promptly exposed. Chen Hu Zong Nam, a rival for the control of the young guard, presented the evidence before the Central Executive Committee as a loyal servant of the revolution. Chen was promptly denounced as a subversive and expelled from the party, though through some personal cunning he avoided attending the CEC meeting. As the residents' faction and the RCA moderate peers were often not so lucky. Chu Min Yu was arrested and thousands of others swept up by the secret police. A savvy elements of the RCA managed to uh, uh, escape and fled Nanjing, utterly routed. Play with tooltips. Play normally. Retire these. Each of the four contenders will receive a rounded strength value that collectively add up to 10 based off the existing party popularity. The Kuomintang Civil War will play out across the East Coast, as each of the factions hope to pay or score rapid victories and convince the undecided outlying garrisons to back them up. During this time, subjugated warlords may rebel. What? Selecting this option will play as a minigame in normal mode, requiring intuition and careful reading of the situation to win. Now, tooltips. Guided mode, which, to which side benefits from each decision. Decision interface. I want that one. What the garbage? We're supposed to get this one done first. God dang it. You know what? I might go back and redo all this. And do this stuff first. And then have everything fall apart and collapse on us. That's probably the best path to go. Because, oh my god, this is insane. 
All right, so we got the civil wars broken up between the rival factions of the Kuomintang's competing claims for the national leadership have been stoked out by Sun Fo, Chen Gong Bo, Chong, Song Jingling, and possibly even ambitious warlords entering the fray. All the while, the Chinese are reconstructing looks in the shadows, opportunistically searching for an opening. The relative power of each faction is displayed below. At the end of the civil war chain, the faction with the greatest amount of power will successfully convince neutral provinces to the other side, ending the conflict in their favor. If there are any deadlock, the military will default to the backing of their old guard affiliated with the Fujian government. Breaking the settlement, even if Fujian is at a disadvantage. Interesting. Well, we got better artillery. At least there's something here for us. Good God, the lesser sum. Always be careful what you wish for. That's a lesson that acting president Sun Fo has learned all too well. Having finally taken the helm of his father's party, but at its darkest hour. Reports have emerged that Deng Yangda and the armies of the PAC have elected to turn west, striking at Wuhan and Chengxia first before making a move on the heavily fortified Nanjing. Cheng Gong, uh, Chen Gongbo was shocked some by going north rather than RCA's traditional strongholds in the south. With well, little to no time to waste, he has made his way to Bai Ping to take advantage of the RCA influence over appointments in freshly conquered territories to scrape together a power base. What is this going to be done? My god. Um, with the help of General Zhang Zizong, they have convinced most northern garrisons to side with them or at least remain neutral for the time being. All the while, Nanjing remains effectively rudderless. Some's most trusted officers, Zhang Fao Kui and Zhu Yi, have struggled to gain a handle on the situation and the latter has left Nanjing to take command of the Wuhan garrison. Most of the intellectual and business support the Reconstruction faction has counted on can provide little but words and support, and the situation grows more and more precarious with each passing week. Sun Fo and a set circle of advisors were in a bind until they recently finally caught a lucky break. The quiet talks to intermediaries finally came through, and advanced the delegation including Song Ziwen, Chen Yoren, and the four elders have offered a broken negotiations between Nanjing and Fujian ending the strife. But Sun Fo's camps are hardly the only ones holding the cowards in Nanjing. The revolution has grown heavily radicalized, and the Chen Revival Society, army officers, have called for extreme measures to end the chaos once and for all. In a meeting, General Hu Zhang Nang, He Zhang Han, and Deng Wenyi have presented a proposal to the Sun advising the acting president to declare martial law. They argue treason as only one punishment and offer to carry out anything necessary to save the nation. Begin negotiations. Sun Fo's and Song Qingling's rebellion in government will gain momentum. Declare martial law immediately. Yeah. Oh my god. Martial law declared, of course. Uh, Sung Fo he was making a Faustian bargain when he agreed to Hu Zhang Nang's plan, but the spread to which his China Revival Society moved to consolidate control was head spinning. With ruthless drive, they swept away any obstacles to their perceived inefficiency, which evidently included what little democratic institutions were left standing in Nanjing. With the minimal debate at a rapid pace, the Rup Legislative Yuan has voted uh, to grant Hu Zhang Nang emergency powers as chairman of the Military Affairs Commission. Ah, perfect, right? Absolutely perfect. Most uh, Sun Fo shock, who was ordered legislative one indefinitely suspended for the duration of the emergency concentrating power around the MAC. He was sure to place his friends in high places, with he, Z Zong Han, being appointed headmaster of Wampo and Deng Yingwei, minister of war. Tai Chung Feng's specific position has not yet formally changed, but he's looking around in the shadows. Zhang Fao Kui has been appointed director of the Hu's headquarters, but kept effectively powerless as Sun Fo's faction find themselves sidelined within his own government. Wow. Uh, the premier thought. Oh, I think this is right here. Oh, I'm going to add that too, because we can. Uh, thought to himself, with tragic stoicism, how remarkably dim the new CRS narrative would, could be. For all their pretensions, ultimately their solution to all the problems would be forced. Should that ever fail in use, they would have nothing. The test to see whether or not these young upstarts would even have a chance to rule soon is approaching. Deng Yan and his army are on the verge of attacking Wuhan, defended by an outnumbered garrison led by Zhu Yi. Zhu Yu. The convention decision would use, be used a flotilla of gunboats and river transports to quickly relieve the city, but the bolder commanders have suggested striking Fujian itself while it is vulnerable, so convinced of their ideological superiority, they believe nothing can keep them from their destiny. Transfer troops west to defend Wuhan. No, I, this is nice to have actually these options here. Who is on Nan's will lose steam? March south to destroy, transfer troops to defend Wuhan. Hey, Mirla, Africa's doing better. Not that we really care. Puna? Yes, please. Nice. There you go. Wow. What a giant mess. The Battle of Wu Cheng. Having moved quickly to defend Wuhan, Hu Zhang Nan's men arrived just in time to square off against Deng Yanda's forces. To the relief of the swamped city garrison, reinforcements arrived by the river to help secure key fortifications outside the city, beating back various probing attacks made by the Fujian army. 
Locked under siege and forced to pull back divisions from a plan of assault on Changsha. Dang committed his forces against the city but struggled to make his way as a weary, undersupplied member were often bested, grinding against enemy fortifications. All the while, Hu, Hu Zongnan's main relief force made their way west, finally arriving after several days. Driving hard into Dang's right flank, Nanjing's elite divisions trounced Dang's exhausted forces, routing them. With his flank on the verge of collapse, Dang had little choice but to withdraw the rest of his army from the Wuhan campaign, breaking the siege. The general and his men outshone the rivals that day, but now are forced to make a hard decision as the Wuhan defenders and their Nanjing relief forces link up. Reports from the central plans or planes indicate that Zheng Zizhong's RCA line army has been on the move from Baiping, and the Scots has been searching for an effective crossing point along the Yangtze. To pursue the retreating Fujian army would mean potentially giving a strategic advantage to Baiping, but to not to do so would allow Deng Yanda to reform his forces for a potential counterattack. All along the Yangtze. March to south. We're gonna have to hold. There's the Dutch East Indies. How are we losing here, y'all? Oh, I guess. Oh, finally gets the French Republic, huh? Come on. We can beat him up, yes. Maybe we can get in there. Maybe, yes. No, maybe so. Fine, hold. Don't lose that tile, though. Whatever you do, do not lose that tile. Mutiny in the high seas. We have, we have a navy? The somewhat of a totalist military dictatorship in Nanjing has not been received well by the fleet, whether it be because of the totalitarian extremist views or the fact that they are primarily army officers by nature, similar sailors, officers, and even the entire ships have defected in large droves, breaking any chance of a meaningful blockade of the eastern seaboard. Many crews have uh, been confronted with a common problem, however, of where to go next. Many sailors are Fujianese and trained in Fujian academies, and consequently have familial ties with the burgeoning rebellion in their home province. On the other hand, plenty have received training. Um, uh, uh, from a broad and exposed the market is sinking, the RCA and their unions have improved plenty of their lives, or at least promised to, and there is, of course, the countless clash between the army leadership and the WM Arca and Fujian and Body and the naval establishment, always leaving the fleet with a short end of the stick. Ultimately, these choices are often made by individuals fleeing under the cover of the night, or perhaps smaller, tight-knit crews. But as an aggregate, they often represent enough to represent entire flotillas of China's limited naval capacity, potentially shifting the tide of war. Fujian rebels are our brothers. The whole army's old guard are not our friends. Yeah, I'm definitely going to replay this. We're actually losing here in two, which is kind of insane to think about, too. Mao Shaowu aligns with Fujian. As word of a looming civil war spreads across the nation, leaders from the distant provinces have been forced to make a choice. Many have done so reluctantly, facing a potential rebellion from their ranks and also fearing choosing the wrong side. As a result, but they decided to remain neutral for the time being, waiting until one faction demonstrates superiority before committing their forces. For Xinjiang, one of the more autonomous governments subju subjugated into a movement, uh, the choice was far easier. They've decided to cast their lots with Song Qingling and Fujian, offering resources to buttress a rebellion. However, perhaps more important, Ma Xiaowu's words of support have reverberated nationwide, uh, potentially tilting up fledged garrisons towards her side. So many other are waiting for, uh, resulting in the battlefield across China's east coast before committing to decision. An interesting development. Holy. Oh, we got rid of. Oh my god, we got rid of the entire other tree. Lead the liberation of Asia. If we miss out on a research slot in an earlier phase of the campaign, we'll unlock a decision in the National Reconstruction category for research. Oh, I like this one. It's merely a natural progression that the Chinese National Revolution will come to encompass the greater revolution for the oppressed and downtrodden peoples of Asia, against a scourge that is imperialism. We have displayed to the world over the past few years that our methods will bring freedom and liberation, that the three provinces will free all those who listen to its words. Three pearls. <laughs> Not quite three pearls. This will be done by... What the heck? Why is it taking so much... You know what, you're done doing this. Make, make these civvies and whatnot. I just don't think we can get it done in 200 days. Is it 200 days left? Uh, a little more. Maybe, but I don't think we'll be able to. Uh, except for Young Leach Chemical Plant, which I think I read last time, too. The Hanwei Industrial Plant. <clears throat> Led by Resource Committee and Ministry of Industry as part of the Greater National Reconstruction Plan. The construction of the Man Shan Central Steel Mills helps to develop Hanwei Steel and Coal Production. Despite being plentiful throughout the land, steel output remains tremendously low throughout China and the largest steel facilities owned by the Japanese in Anshan. Creating a national central steel facility, therefore, will reduce imperialistic influence in our economy, as well as expanding our steel production to its true potential. Furthermore, we'll have to develop the local infrastructure in the region in order to allow for an efficient way of transporting our coal. Build, 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 build. build. Oh, we actually have some extra planes here, huh? It's not bad, but still. Guess we're not allowed to sound planes, huh? Let's get a little more organization first before we move out and do anything else. The push along the Yangtze. General Zhang Zizong was never a particularly devoted Wang loyalist or an RCA member, but had a commitment to duty which refuses to abandon, even as many in the military. 
found their way to, into seditionist camps. Um, Zhang remained a steadfast defender of the government and an anchor for which the civilian Wang and the RCA could depend on and end off Bonapartism within the military. With the civil war underway, he and the political department clique were the backbone in which the army of Chen Gong Bo's Biping government was built upon. Smaller than the other factions, they were nonetheless determined to prevail as they gathered in Baoding. Clued in thanks to the, some of valuable intelligence, gathered by Zhu and Lai's men, they learned of the CRS's effective coup in Nanjing, based off that uh, intel he recognized that armies of Nanjing and Fujian would likely tear themselves out fighting an, uh, one another, and so Zhang decided to wait before leading his army down south. Fresh for the impending fight, the vanguards arrived at the Yangtze River, battling scattered garrisons hoping to prevent them from crossing. Nanjing forces a race of blow bridges to delay their advance as Zhang's men search for a weak point. Should they be successful, Zhang believes that many remaining loyalists hiding in the Jiangnan and Anhui regions, the focus of the RCA recruitment and development efforts for years, will rise up in support. The fate of their campaign lies in the balance. Nanjing forces hold the river. The CRS has successfully def defended the Yangtze River thanks to the high momentum consolidating their hold of the Jiangnan region. The momentum of the Nanjing government has been added to Lu Na Zhongnan's momentum. Oh god, how much momentum do we have? Only 13. Mumbai? Can we get at least in Mumbai? That'd be pretty nice. Darn it, we can't. I'm trying to shell Mumbai. No, we can't. Dang it. You just hold. Dust settles in the east. Oh god, we're about to get cut off here. Drastic times often call for drastic measures. Uh, but one must always ask, at what cost? Beset with uh, rebels on all sides. They're disintegrating. Uh, government of some foes forced to turn to military extremists to salvage their position. If the goal is to stem the time to prevent a prolonged civil war, Hu, Nang, Hu Zhang Nang did not disappoint. Uh, yeah. Oh, if we have to, we have to. Um, hammered from the north and south, the soldiers of the China Revival Society proved their mind and extended campaign, even defeat. Many continued to fight on with a wampa spirit of indomitable fanatical courage that prevailed over Nanjing's enemies. Zhang Zizhong's Rongxi River campaign proved to be a bust in the end, too far from the northern supply base to sustain such a violent campaign for very long. Brutally crushed in the ensuing fights, many of their units melted away or even defected to the south. Zhang Yanda's renewed attempt to take Nanjing ultimately came to naught. After a few weeks grinding against Nanjing's fanatical divisions, most governors of outlying provinces had enough and sided with the central government. The garrisons in Hai Bia, Manchuria, having lost heart betrayed, Chen Gong Bo forced them into ignominious exile. With most of the country against them, Fujian devolved into infighting and was forced to surrender. Hu uh, uh, Zhongnan now stands as effective leader of the nation, having effectively sidelined Sun Fo and prevented any negotiation that might dilute the KMT's revolutionary promises. Throughout the campaign, he has worryingly been addressing himself as Generalissimo, a concern that was fully realized today in Nanjing with his confirmation as president for the duration of the continued emergency. The enemy's uh, camarilla of selected, primarily military officers of the CRS. Some like he, Zhang Han, prefer the spotlight, though never allowed more than the Red Generalissimo himself, while others like Dai Chunfeng and Deng Wenyi are content with machinations in the background. Who Zhang Nan trumps overall? Well, would you look at that? We oh, get lose twenty five percent of political power. Holy crap! A third national revolution. The second revolution ended the same way the first did, betrayed by corrupt and power hungry anti revolutionary leaders and foreign imperialists. Meanwhile, the revolution that the martyrs and late founder fought and died for years to be fulfilled. At last, with the dust finally cleared. Hu Zongnan and the China Revival Society can finally implement the third revolution to fully bring Dr. Sun's dream for a free China to reality. The China Revival Society declares victory. Hell, you bet it does. While the Kuomintang succeeded in unifying the country under the party flag, the party descended into civil war following the assassination and death of the former chairman, Wang Jingwei. A squabbling faction of forces began to fight one another over the radical China Revival Society managed to seize power and secure the country in a state of emergency. In a grand speech from Nanjing, Generalissimo Hu Zongnan has declared that all enemies of China, both foreign and domestic, should be crushed under new direction of the national revolution. The CRS's talk of a totalitarian revolution inspired by the likes of Savinkov, Mussolini, and Mosley shall surely dim a light on any chances of democracy in China. Darkness has befallen the national revolution. No, it depends on your opinion. God, who's, who's, who's writing this? Authorized Special Services. I think I read this before. So if you know this again, please go ahead. Did I read about the Central Aviation School? Um, befitting China's war torn, divided nature during the Vel world, oh, Valkyrie, warlord era, many different warlord factions as well as Zili government sought to create their own air force to get advantage over one another. These programs are often too small and underfunded to be much good on their own, but if we bring them all together under one roof, it could be a foundation for real force multiplier for armies. Expand mechanized operations. European developments, made by syndicalist officers such as Basil Little Hart over the past few years, have illustrated the importance of mechanized warfare in future battles and wars as means of speed and breakthrough. Given the NRA's own favoritism of mobility and speed, some of our officer corps propose that we gradually adopt more experimental mechanized operations. Smoldering members. Look at that. <clears throat> oh crap, are you kidding me? 
Pujian lies in ruins. Cities such as Yemen and Longyan lie brutally destroyed and ravaged by, with provisional action committee guerrillas having made a desperate last stand in Longyan. Much of what the Mangan government has built lies in destruction and blue shirt militias have gone to work, handling the surrender's remaining insurgents. In a report sent back to the high command under the now generalissimo Hu Zongnam, General Deng Wenyi relayed to the capital that the region is effectively pacified. While the ashes are burning high and the embers smoldering, the China Revival Society seems poised to secure the rest of the country. Nonetheless, the traitors, Generals uh, Deng Yan, Dan, Zhu, and Lai have yet to be found and are presumed to be alive, most likely organizing further resistance towards the leadership of the CRS. There's also the issue and threat of further insurgent cells aligned to the PAC, the RCA, and even the CSB in major cities and rural areas around the country. Thankfully, with the former members of the RC and the PAC so bitterly divided against one another, it seems unlikely they'll ever band together in a meaningful capacity, if anything. The former factions have grown more divided, splintering into the hardened, paranoid rebel cells under local personalities. Despite this, unrest continues, and it's clear to the generalissimo that, to, to the leadership of the CRS, that pacification is yet to still be fully achieved. We may have won the war, but not the peace. Why don't we ever win peace here? Go, 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 get out. Well, or you're going to get encircled, aren't you? Gathering storm clouds. As the pacification campaigns rage on, and the China Revival Society struggles to uphold what little legitimacy it has to the leadership of the KMT and the Chinese nation, greater troubles abound the Republic as the nation's economy is in utter ruins. Large German centers and parts of the countryside land devastation due to the civil war and the country's economic growth, which is perceived to be on the rise after unification, has effectively halted. To make matters worse, it seems that the foreign trade, even with the third international, have largely stopped due to the open xenophobia and national rhetoric of the CRS. The violence of the CRS, especially regarding the anti imperialistic and anti foreign outlook, as that many foreigners are simply leave China and any potential investments from the foreign countries seem unlikely. Foreign bankers and investors have liquidated their investments nearly overnight upon their victory of the CRS. Furthermore, many wealthy Chinese expatriates in places such as Southeast Asia and Hawaii now have also withdrawn support for the party, with many denouncing Hu Zongnong's coup of the government as unlawful and lamenting the party's division. Oh god. With an economy returning to elite war levels of devastation and stagnation, it's unlikely that China's economy will be able to recover quickly. The storm clouds have gathered over China and the country grows restless even further. If the CRS is, are indeed to hold on to the claims of the Chinese leadership, then they must act quickly in resolving the economic crisis. A tragedy befalls the nation. So unless we're trying to build stuff fast enough, god dang it. Yeah, and they died. Of course. Oh, so we got more stuff here too, look at that. Finally, that's a focus like at least half the hour. Which is fine, you know, it is what it is, but still. Lead the liberation of Asia? Yeah, why not? God dang it, India won. Consolidate the frontiers. Secure the northern frontier. The liberation war against, oh my god, so many other people. Never another humiliation, faction leader. Demand the, the return of the concessions. Liberate Taiwan. Um, the Republic's only salvation. The national populace and autocrats, paternal autocrats, will join the faction. Devastated nation, rally the blue shirts. For a year? Huh. Oh. That's not bad. I like more civility too. But Minzu Ushihuizui. What we need first and foremost in our nation is an economic reform, one that follows the totalitarian concepts of society. Our economy shall reject the fall of capitalism, and instead we demand an economy completely planned and controlled by the state. This project system will be known as the National Socialism, an ideal society in which all productivity activity shall be led by the state. Oh, a research lot, yeah. China's greatest problem is education. The failure of education has caused problems within the party and the nation. We should eliminate all local autonomy of public school and close down private and religious states. The curricula school should only feature a national education system focused on Chinese culture and Chinese problems. Their goal is a possible for students, a single-minded love for the dear motherland. Examine foreign designs. Domestic armor production. It's not bad. Uh, medium tanks would be nice. Well, honestly, as much as I want to do this one, it makes sense since we did do examine foreign designs from, like, previously. There's no secret that while China certainly has some of the means potential to fully embrace elements of a modern military such as mechanization, actually doing so will definitely take a long while. We are long sought training and advice from the European cynical nations who are leading the world in armored warfare, and would do well to look to the same designs for inspiration. Towards uh, forward-thinking officer corps. The future of any successful military lies not in its generals or its soldiers, but rather the concepts and theories that drive progress within our own doctrine. With the return of the KMT and the NRI's success in the Northern Expedition, some officers who stayed overseas in training have now returned with fresh, bold, and radical ideas on how to modernize the NRA. Um, encourage the doctrine of an initiative. The concept of initiative as a means of offense is one that is employed by the National Revolutionary Army. <clears throat> but it's also a concept that we shall certainly apply to our own aerial program. By encouraging our pilots to follow the European concept of aerial initiative, we'll have our fighters and bombers focus on more offensive capabilities rather than defensive ones. Purchase foreign blueprints. While China certainly has the resources and capabilities to launch its own aerial development scheme, our technological progress in flight still lags years behind modern European designs. Years of exile in Europe have allowed us to test and examine European plane designs from the British Republican Air Force and the Communard Air Force. 
Let us purchase foreign blueprints and designs to create our own modern planes. Salvage by Yang Fleet. Given we've only so many resources on hand, our limited production capacity and allowing construction time for new ships is best that we can make use of what our Bao Yang predecessors have left us. Although much has been either stolen or a smoldering wreck, there are still ships, facilities, and personnel that can be reused for much better purpose. Nothing is irreplaceable, but every ship or every help, and every bit helps. Ooh. We renovate Xiongnan dockyards. One of the most important naval facilities in the nation are the Xiongnan dockyards. Forced to turn to civilian naval development to sustain its finances, now that I've successfully recovered Shanghai from the foreign colonizers, we'll turn Xiongnan into the engine of a new grander fleet of, of the Republic. An influx of investment will recruit new staff, create new dry docks, and above all, produce new ships. We can wait. We need a. Uh, how, how long will this take? 340 years? It's not bad, but we still want some heavy stuff here. Or maybe carriers, maybe. The fading light of Ming Quan. Look at that. <clears throat> oh, god dang it. Come on. Some folk didn't know or would have ever dreamed that the party would become like this. Sure, his father had authoritarian tendencies, but did not leave the sanctuary of the Hawaiian Islands to partake in the idealistic Second Northern Expedition, only to see the collapse of the excesses of, of totalitarianism and tyranny. While he is still de facto premier of the executive Yuan, what good difference does it make now that the National Revolutionary Army controls all parliamentary and civilian affairs? Oh, permanent capital. Officially, the Reconstruction faction so controls the legislative Yuan and other civilian organs of the government. But this does not matter much as the entire party's direction and military operations are entirely in the hands of Hu Zongnan and his followers. Under the direction of Hu, a state of emergency is still to be maintained indefinitely. The legislative Yuan has been indefinitely suspended, further adding to the uncertainty of the party's future. Officially, the China Revival Society does seek to uphold Dr. Sun's three principles of the people, one which is Min Quan, the people's rights and democracy, but plenty of the CRS radicals such as He Zongnan will believe that democracy simply has no place in modern society to them. Democracy is a poison that sustains, that stains the party's lifeline as a degenerative disease upon the party. He Zong Han views the legislative uh, Yuan as inherently bourgeois and seeks to abolish it, indeed much of the bureaucratic apparatus that allows the government to run. Almost every now and then. Uh, he uh, Zong Han and Sun Fo clashed in Generalissimo's whose office jostling over the fate of the suspended legislature. Although it would be powerless rubber stamping committee even if it did reopen, it will still reopen or still slow down the worst successes of the new regime and therefore poses a threat to he uh, Zong Han's wild ambitions, but for now the state of emergency seems to have no end in sight. Darkness falls over the once bright revolution and declared a permanent capital. There have been many capitals of the United Chinese State, and with key parts of China under our rule, we can proclaim a permanent capital for the Republic. There are four main choices to go with. Should we control the city? Nanjing, Beijing, Wuhan, or Guangzhou? Each one brings unique advantages. Consider this carefully as the decision will be irreversible. With the unification of China, it's time to finally set the new permanent seat of this new central government. Beijing would be the natural choice, as the ancient city that has been the capital of Chinese governments consistently for the past centuries under the Yuan. A strong contender, it would represent a natural, stable transition from the old. This hour also works against it, being strongly associated with the monarchy and the failed Baiyan government. To a lesser extent, it emphasizes a certain northern political dominance in the national politics. Nanjing is another potential choice, leading closer to the center of China, between the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers. Nanjing was also the capital of the Ming Dynasty, the provisional capital of the First Republic before Yuan Shikai's usurpation, and a significant value among nationalists and republicans. Similarly, Wuhan. Located further in Lin was the site of the Wu Chang Uprising, the epicenter of the Xinhai Revolution that was first top of the Qing monarchy. Its symbolism has made it a popular choice for revolutionaries who seek a firm break from the old order. Guangzhou. Uh, a controversial choice has also been thrown into the mix. The economic center of the south and a major port city has also been the traditional hotbed for Republican revolutionary movements. Both the KMT and the Federalist Movement trace the roots here, and many other leading officers grew up or were trained in the city since the start of the constitutional protection movement. Other cities have been considered, however, as discussions draw to close, it seems that the list has been quickly narrowed. After further deliberation, China's authorities have settled on Baiping, Wuhan, Guangzhou, staying Nanjing. I kind of like Nanjing the most. That makes the most sense for us, I think. So, and We're going to end the episode there. I might not actually replace off screen. We'll see, because we still have 180 days, 6 months, to get 10, 11 more factories, which might be doable, but we have no political power. But then again, we're playing as China. What do you expect? But... Hey, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we're going to struggle greatly once again playing as the Republic of China. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.